But as long as they don't touch mad as hell, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry to do this to your first show back, but uh, bad news for those who enjoy hearing our studio audience. The Victorian government's restriction on public gatherings yesterday means we don't have one tonight. If they were here, they'd be making an ah oh noise right now. Good news, though, for those of you who find them annoying and too loud and like working out where the jokes are yourselves. It's a bit of yin, it's a bit of yang. We're all in this together, even if they're not here. And uh, I think we'll be OK. We did the last season and a half without any audience feedback at all. And the only effect it had on us was that, uh, like most of us last year, stuck in an empty room processing what's going on in the world, we've naturally drifted to the right. So this season, you might notice we're now a lot more supportive of the government and the great work that the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, is doing. Particularly the work he's been doing, as he says, encouraging people, particularly the vulnerable and the elderly, to get those vaccinations. Because let's face it, the vulnerable and the elderly are the ABC's target demographic. So it's really in both our interests to keep them alive. In fact, uh, as of next week, the ABC will be a vaccination hub. So if you do want to come and watch the show being taped, uh, we have supplies of the good stuff. Uh, none of your AstraZeneca rubbish here, uh, which we'll be more than happy to sell you. And of course, as part of the National Resilience Program, we have qualified Commonwealth endorsed professionals handpicked by Greg Hunt himself to administer the shots. Isn't that right, Grun? <sighs> now, uh, given our experience with major national projects like the NBN and the last census, who would have thought the COVID vaccine rollout would have been such a disaster? Put your hands down, please. That joke would have worked much better if they were here. So far, though, only a small fraction of Australians have received their dose, whereas one in three Americans have been vaccinated. That's nearly as many as own a gun. Now, no one's blaming our government. The fact of the matter is governments have very little experience in this area. I mean, yes, you'd think that the insertion of sharp objects into its citizens would sit comfortably with some of our elected members. But for political reasons, Conservative governments tend to shy away from inflicting pain on their fellow Australians, unless they're part of the arts sector, the ABC or unemployed. And while problems with the AstraZeneca vaccine have made anti-vaxxers seem momentarily sane, it will clearly save millions of lives. The only downside I can see to surviving this pandemic is that it means we may live long enough to have to go into aged care, or as it's more accurately called, aged accommodation. But the government's focus uh, remains well and truly fixed on the implementation... ..of a successful vaccine rollout for the most vulnerable Australians. Yes, as hard to say as it is to do, apparently. But I'm not here to be pedantic. Voluble Australians aren't interested in that. Of course, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, knows how to say vaccine properly. And when it comes to the vaccination program, it does, it, uh, it is important that we get this done. Mm. I guess that's why they're calling Howard Springs a national resilience centre instead of a vaccination one. I wonder why he has difficulty with that word. Well, it's impossible for me for to say at this point. Clearly. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I am sorry. I'm just nitpicking and obviously he can say it. We have footage, I think. Uh, can we show the footage to be fair to the PM? The vaccination program, as it's set out in the budget papers... Papers? just assumes that it's likely that this will be in place by the end of the year. But that could happen with two doses, one doses. One doses? And that will not have a material impact on what is in this budget, and it would be a mistake to think that it did. Hmm. And the last thing we want is any more mistakes. Although... When inevitable occasional breaches occur, then the testing and the tracing regime is able to contain that. Yes, our testing regime is unparalleled. Anyway, as I say, I don't want to sit here and pick on every little thing the PM says. It's only a 12-episode season after all. But however he pronounces it, rest assured that he is focused on keeping us safe. Right now, I'm fighting the virus. Though it must be said, he doesn't hold a syringe. Now, obviously, we're not going to spend the whole show talking about COVID. That would be depressing and boring. Unless you want me to. <laughs> OK, just one more then. Um, uh, about the whole uh, ongoing Australians returning from India debacle, which I think could do with a little bit of plain speaking. 
Now, the uh, travel ban clearly damaged the government. Uh, frankly, the PM hadn't been that unpopular since last year's bushfires. Back then, his defence was that he didn't hold a hose. A defence, incidentally, he, he could have also used during this year's floods. A missed opportunity there. But I think it was the criticism of former cricketer Michael Slater that would have stung the most when he tweeted the PM should pop over in his private jet and witness the dead bodies on the street. Not the most alluring holiday package I've ever heard of, and certainly not a patch on Hawaii. If, if I were on at the time, I would have happily defended the PM, but sadly I wasn't, and it was left to the Minister for Agriculture, David Littleproud, who said Slater should get over himself. Or perhaps he meant Slater should get over to Australia himself. Get over himself. It's not clear. Before saying quite rightly, I think, yes, we granted Michael Slater authority to travel to India, but there's this thing called personal responsibility. Spot on. Michael Slater should have taken some personal responsibility for the Australian government's decision not to let Australians back into the country, rather than blame it on someone else. I certainly don't blame the Morrison government for threatening Australians returning from India with fines and jail time, and neither does the Morrison government. They blame the CMO, Paul Kelly. Sure, it's unusual to get advice on criminal penalties from a chief medical officer, but these are unusual times. And anyway, Australia has a proud tradition of abandoning its own in times of crisis. Where would those Anzac war horses we left behind after World War I be today if we hadn't abandoned them? Not in Egypt, that's for sure. Quarantine was too hard for the federal government to arrange back then, and by Godfrey, it's too hard to arrange now. So to all of you who think we've failed our own, what would you rather the Morrison government do? Their job competently or, or something that they think will play well to that narrow band of voters they need to win the next election by a seat or two? If there was a flag here, I'd salute it. Unfortunately, it's at the cleaners. Please like and subscribe. <laughs> well, later on, with Japan still in a state of emergency, I speak to the Australian Olympic sous chef de mission and ask him, should our track athletes consider keeping at least 1.5 metres from other competitors? Sean, these are Australian runners. They'll be doing that anyway. And with a nationwide poll showing over 70% of Australians believe our borders should remain closed until after COVID is under control, does this mean there'll be a plebiscite on it? Plus, vaccine hesitancy. Yes, excuse me, Sean? Uh, yes, yes, lady down there in the front row there. Yeah, just on that, uh, there's talk about a safe injecting room opening in the city and people complain about the potential influx of drug users into the area. Well, a mass vaccination hub opens in the CBD and doctors complain that nobody shows up. Why not just put heroin in the vaccine? Well, that's a, it's a good idea. You should pass that on to the government. I also think I know how to make mRNA vaccine. Well, well they're aftermarket solutions, so get good, good, great. <laughs> so how long do we keep our international borders closed? National Senator Matt Canavan compared it to being like living in our own Dutch oven when he said... We cannot stay under the doona forever. I mean, I assume that's what he meant. Personally, I, I would have used a more tasteful metaphor, but that's Matt, he's blunt. I prefer the more sensitive language of Virgin Australia's chief executive, Jane Herdlicker, not one of our made-up names, when she said uh, we should open up despite the fact that people may die. Twice upon from the Australian Chamber of Torture, Commerce and Industry, we're familiar enough with the notion of people dying for their country. Is it right that we ask them to die for the economy too? Well, Sean, whether it's COVID-19 or influenza, people are going to die. What are your demands? No, no, I'm not threatening to kill them. Oh, well, I beg your pardon. Sorry. It's just inevitable, that's all. And we want them to die. It's healthy. So what now? Yeah, for the economy. Oh. Uh, people continuing to die reduces the strain on our physical and welfare infrastructures. And we thank them. Our dead play a vital role in our prosperity. Yes, they do buy life insurance policies, don't they? So we believe that a few deaths in order to open up business is a small price to pay. Mm. Twice upon there with a bargain for those vulnerable to viral infections. Well, the tourism sector has perhaps been the hardest hit by the pandemic and without the return of visitors from overseas or even Australians from overseas, we're being encouraged by the government to fill the void they created with their winding up of JobKeeper by spending up big on a local holiday. Tomorrow happenstance uh, from Tourism Australia, our Tourism Minister, Dan Tian, says Australians should avoid penny-pinching and spend on a holiday like you've never spent before. Now, surely Australians wouldn't know how to spend on a holiday if they've never spent before. Sure, uh, Dan's message is simply to get out there and see Australia and all our wonderful attractions. Go and see the big koala at Dad's Wells Bridge. Have a potato cake while you're there, or a Snickers, or a battered sausage, and don't hold back, get some sachets of sauce and mustard too. Go to Werribee, 
Go to Lucas Heights. Go to Tail and Bend. Have a meal at the Elephant and Stapler with Brian and Val McCracken. Get yourself an $18 Palmer and Pot on a Tuesday with a side of Blanche Seasonal Greens for $6.50. Or try the curried scallops and jasmine rice for $24 and hook into a glass of Tamar Ridge Riesling with its racy acidity and intense citrus notes for $11. But above all, just get out there and be financially irresponsible. <laughs> As far as the overseas travel goes, uh, the only bubble in the tourism brain at the moment is New Zealand. Will that be enough as we decompress out of the COVID crisis? Yeah, well, it's a two-way street, Sean. Great the Kiwis are coming over here and blowing their dough because we're great mates and that since we died together at Gallipoli. Yep. But if only the Aussies didn't have to go to their stupid country in return. Blow your money in Australia first, you ass wipes. Once uh, the rest of the world opens up, though, I guess we uh, won't need New Zealand as much. Too right, Sean. And then New Zealand can get back to doing what it does best, being where we deport the criminals who happen to have been born there. Mm -hmm. And we can get back to being number one place in the world to come if you want to get married with the Harbour Bridge in the background instead of something Chinese. Mm -hmm. Sanger and Asaf? No, I'm good. Thank you very Just much. Just me? Oh, sure. In it. How would you like to mount an inquiry into the Prime Minister's office about why the Secretary of the Prime Minister and Cabinet paused his inquiry into why the PM wasn't told anything in the first place? Do the officers in Parliament House need blotters? Then be as the wind, my pretty, and make sure that it's released either no earlier than 5.30pm on a Friday or as a distraction during whatever our next unedifying clusterfuck may be. Be gone! Sure gay sex went on in there. It's a prayer room, isn't it? Well, you better start saying your prayers. I've got room for you at the unemployment office. Minister? And I'm not talking about the one just outside Michaelia Cash's. Is that a threat? Yes, it is. It's a cheap suit. I don't get no fancy uniforms like you rich boys from security. Threat, not thread. Calm down. You want to know who knew what and when? You need to find out why. Then you'll know how. Who? Let me show you where. Yeah, I've been a cleaner here since Menzies recited that filthy limerick to Queen Elizabeth back in 52. I've got a copy of it here, I think. Yeah, I did but see her passing by. We haven't got time for this, you old fool. I want Phil Gation's paws dossier and I want it now. Hey! No one tells me what to do. I work for the public service. You see that sack over there, hula hooping and trying to read the Bible? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Yeah, what of it? That's the Governor General's wife. Why didn't you say so? Bridget McKenzie. Angus Taylor. Stuart Robert. Christopher Pine. Ah, here we go. The Gations dossier complete with a post-it note written by the PM himself. Whatever you do, don't mention my name or I'll have you killed, just like I did the hopes and dreams for the future of every Australian man, woman and child. <laughs> Excellent work, Enid. Have it leaked to Peter Van Onselen in time for whatever it is he thinks he does on the project. And Miller? Arrange for the leadership spill, my dreadlord. Yeah. But in the meantime, let's watch this tape of Christopher Pine auditioning for Hamilton. <laughs> you need to take the, the take the. <laughs> and nods as good as a swing. Enid Swink, followed by Cornwall's most unorthodox lady detective in Cartwheel and Cindy. Welcome back. Well, it's all done and dusted for another year. Here's Stephen with all you need to know about this year's Eurovision Song Contest. Thanks, Stephen. Now, despite the pandemic, the Australian economy has been going gangbusters, which is something we can all be proud of, assuming it has anything to do with us. The federal budget then pumps $75 billion into this roaring beast, which is like injecting pure cocaine into a child with a hyperactivity disorder. But despite the government sinking unprecedented amounts of money into areas of unprecedented neglect, there were still the whining objections from the usual anti-coalition government ratbags, like coalition government senator Matt Canavan, pointing to high levels of debt. And interestingly, the PM forecast that there was no surplus scheduled and foreseeable within the next decade. So he's obviously expecting Labor to form government soon. Uh, there was good news too for the ABC in that they haven't disbanded it, 
and more money for infrastructure, which uh, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Michael McCormack, reckons will be enough for the next 1,000 years. Uh, we've made sure that that money is now going to stretch out uh, to 3031. Mm, now, there's a man who can budget. Finance Minister Simon Birmingham also talked up their aged care spend. Australians will see a once-in-a-generation investment in aged care. Which uh, may explain why we have an aged care disaster. We only invest in it once in a generation. It does sound a note of optimism, though, for the aged care workforce, which is stretched to its limit. We're buggered. <laughs> We're literally buggered. Literally buggered? What on earth is going on in these nursing homes? A and what of Anthony Albanese? What was his forensic analysis of the government's economic blueprint? This is like a showbag budget. A budget that looks pretty flashy, but when you take it home, only lasts a few days. Mm. Labor Apparatchik, Vagary Bell Chamber, what, what did he mean, if anything? Oh, it's a highly relatable analogy, Sean. Well, if we accept that a showbag only lasts a few days, and he's obviously never bought a Bertie Beetle one, which is pretty much gone while you're waiting for your change, in what sense does the budget only last a few days? Yeah, well, if you're just going to pick on everything he says... Yes? We're rooted. Speaking of which, the last uh, survey has Albo's support down to 24% as preferred Prime Minister compared with Scott Morrison's 50. That the voters can't even imagine Albo doing a better job than someone they can actually see is dreadful means he's not cutting through, is he? Well, Sean, we've got a new three-word slogan that reflects how Labor sees Australia moving forward. On your side. Of course, referring to the recovery position that the injured must be placed in before attempting resuscitation. Mm. Albo is pledging to lay the country on our side before administering mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Right. Well, uh, going by those numbers, he's not going to need to put on the lip balm anytime soon. Well, Sean, Albo is election-ready. He's been overusing the football metaphors. I said uh, on the day that I became leader uh, that uh, I wanted to play it like a, a four-quarter match uh, and the, uh, the siren for the first fourth quarter and the bounce would occur on Budget Day this year. Uh, we intend to kick with the wind as well in the fourth quarter. Yeah, people, people love having everything reduced to footy, Sean. Oh, and he's launched a WeChat account for Chinese Australians. All right, and I think we have what Albo said in his very first post here. Yeah. Um... If the Labor Party is elected to the government, the leader of the Labor Party will become the next Prime Minister of Australia. Yeah. It's a good scoop. That'll be enough, do you think? Oh, better be. That's all we've got. It's helpful information, though, because, you know, being from China, they might not know that, that voting could lead to someone else getting in. Hmm. Yeah. Another way you can tell there's an election looming, other than getting sprayed with the government's out-of-control fire hose of a budget, is that the comedy starts getting rolled out. Albo again. Again, a sleight of hand. All smirk and mirrors. Not quite as good as Bill, but uh, who is? Although, let's not underestimate Deputy PM Michael McCormick. There is no cut. There is no cut. The only cut I've seen this week was the haircut I got the other day. Actually, no. On second thoughts, underestimate Michael McCormick. Well, later on, the uh, Treasurer promises things will be better than they were in the old days. They will then be better off compared to what they would have been in back in 1718. 1718? I certainly hope so. The average wage back then was uh, half a shilling a week. But for the moment, the government's decision to rack up a trillion dollars worth of debt to be paid off by future generations poses a dilemma. Where, where does it leave Labor? Well, Sean, more than 70% of Australians approved of the federal budget. So to finally have Labor's debt and deficit approach to the economy embraced by the electorate is really affirming. So if we can get the coalition to adopt more and more of our policies, we might be able to effectively govern from opposition. Well, you could be in for a record term, I think. Awesome! Well, proving that the unliberalness of the federal budget wasn't a flash in the pan, the Morrison government has now decided to build a gas-fired power station tipping $600 million into the Hunter Valley Curry Curry project. Now, compared to the $70 billion spend in the budget, it's a drop in the ocean, although we really don't need to be adding anything more to ocean levels given the impact that this gas plant could have on the environment. Views on the decision are split. On the one hand, Labor MP Joel Fitzgibbon has backed it, saying it's unequivocally a good idea. While on the other side of politics, Labor energy spokesman Chris Bowen said the proposal isn't justified by the economics. So, Vagary, while Labor has abandoned much of what they went uh, to the 2019 election with, they've at least kept their disunity on energy. Yeah, we remain committed to that principle, Sean. Yeah. Awesome.
Well, outside politics, there has been criticism that the new 660 megawatt power plant, which is not needed in New South Wales or nationally, will have to run on diesel until gas delivery pipelines are built and might kill off existing players in the industry. Gregory Anton, in charge of the photocopying in Angus Taylor's office. Why spend taxpayers' money building something that's not needed, wanted, is unsupported by infrastructure and is detrimental to the market principles that you lot traditionally fall back on whenever you don't want to help someone? <laughs> Why, my dear, you are quite mistaken. We have never trusted the market to look after you. We have always spent taxpayers' money to build and maintain public utilities. No, 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 but the market and the state governments have already worked out renewable alternatives and invested in batteries to store power when, you know, the sun isn't blowing and the wind isn't shining. Sean, where, uh, where is that brooch I gave you at the beginning of the interview? Uh, a brooch? You've lost it, haven't you, my dear? You're always forgetting things, just as you have forgotten that the coalition has always been ideologically in favour of state ownership and fundamentally opposed to capitalism. Yeah, but uh, surely aren't you just playing up to your gas lobby mates by building this thing and ignoring the advice of the Australian energy market operator? Who? Well, the... Oh, oh, here it is. It was in your purse all along. If only I could get inside that brain of yours and understand what makes you say and do these crazy, twisted things. Yes, but Angus Taylor... That's when it began. I can see him still, standing there and saying, look, look at this PDF about Clover Moore's air travel and staring at nothing. He had nothing in his hand. I don't remember you giving me this brooch. Of course, your mother was mad too. She died in an asylum when you were a year old. Really? It began with her imagining things, hearing noises, footsteps, voices, G7 recommendations regarding fossil fuels. And in the end, she died in an asylum with no brain at all. Well, thank you, Gregory. I'm sorry I doubted you. What the government wants, of course, is power security for manufacturing because... Just so important that we have self-sufficiency. Obviously, in a pandemic, we can't rely on imports. Although we are already self-sufficient in some areas. Australia makes its own luck. Mm, just as well. It's in short supply overseas. Speaking of which, with just a hint of what we can expect later in her wrap-up of world news, here's Chica Lydia Rowlands. Thanks, Sean. Tonight, fence farce. A man and woman have been caught scaling a fence around Prince Andrew's Windsor home. Let's hope they got out of there safely. Also, disgusting thing! Japan is set to release more than one million tonnes of treated radioactive water from the Fukushima power plant into the ocean, suggesting they've run out of harpoons for their whale research. Plus, shit, check this out. China has become just the third country to land a spacecraft on Mars. It's part of their one country, two planets approach. <laughs> so they can communicate with a vehicle on Mars, all right, but not with the Department of Foreign Affairs in Canberra. Sean? Looking forward to that. Thank you very much, Chica Lydia. And uh, just briefly on the Middle East, Barnaby Joyce says Australia shouldn't get involved in the dispute between Israel and Palestine because he doesn't want to see those tensions flare up here in Australia. Now, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. He used far more diplomatic language than that. I don't want to see someone else's turd in my toilet. Mm. He's quite right. I think it's only fair that Barnaby's toilet be reserved for Barnaby's turds. It's hard to know what's more offensive, isn't it? Equating the Arab-Israeli conflict with a turd or equating Australia with a toilet. We should run a competition and find out which one. Maybe next week. Well, Defence Minister and, I'd like to think, friend of the show, Peter Dutton, has struck another blow for Australia's sovereignty by banning morning teas in support of the LGBTQI plus community within the Defence Force, saying we are not pursuing a woke agenda. So, Bobo, I guess uh, not pursuing a woke agenda is safer than sabre-rattling against China. No, oh, I don't know, Sean. A lot of us who support the International Day against homophobia, biphobia, interphobia and transphobia are heavily armed. But it's maybe for the best. You don't want to be out there fighting the enemy and be same-sex attracted to each other. Makes it very difficult to kill or be killed. Still, on balance, you must be delighted that Peter Dutton is your new Minister for Defence. Delighted isn't the word, Sean. Now that someone is in charge who isn't afraid of a fight, whether it's with the Defence Force Chief over morning teas or not, the world is finally going to get a chance to see what we're made of on the battlefield. Is that because your bodies will be ripped apart by enemy gunfire? Very probably. Peter Dutton doesn't know the meaning of the word diplomacy. Mm. Or very likely cat.
Not everyone is happy, though, with his decision to overrule the Defence Chief's decision to strip citations from over 3,000 soldiers as punishment in the wake of the Brereton inquiry. Well, why shouldn't our brave men and women, or wherever they are on the spectrum, be covered in glory for defending this country, even if it is in Afghanistan? All's fair in love and war, Sean, whether you're simulating oral sex with your commanding officer or drinking from the prosthetic leg of someone you've killed in action. And if there's a morning tea celebration that doesn't pursue a woke agenda more than that, I'll go he, or she, or whatever pronoun you prefer. Australia has, of course, withdrawn all remaining troops from Afghanistan and let the Taliban resume power. We've run away, yes. If the soldiers are keeping their honours and being silenced as to whether their commanders and political leaders should be held accountable for regimental failures, and the public has lost confidence in the ADF, what good has come from releasing the Brereton Report? Well, it's better than releasing the Kraken! <laughs> Uh, no, thanks. I'm driving. Name. Charlie. Email address. Pickering.charlie at... Hi. I'm just sitting here trying to hack into Charlie Pickering's ABC account. By accessing his personal information, I can find out more about him and on-sell that information to data harvesting companies to help make up for this year's budget shortfall. Or let the Department of Home Affairs have it, because judging from his internet search history, he's a terrorist. Whoa, 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 inside voice. I've got this. The ABC respects your privacy and will ensure that any information you provide is kept safe and secure, like the My Health Records system or the time those classified documents were found in a dumped filing cabinet. Soon, you'll need an account to watch anything on the ABC, because it'll all be on iView and the free-to-air channel will have been shut down because... Murdoch. Personalise your experience with an ABC account today, because pretty soon you won't have a choice anyway. Female representation has long been a thorn in the penis of the conservative side of politics. Advisor on women's issues to the Woman Minister for Women, Dramella Burt, uh, and I do just point out that this conversation is being recorded for training and quality purposes, and so we can broadcast it. Whatevs. So, merit or quotas? The merit system hasn't done women any favours, so why not introduce quotas? Uh, because quotas is socialism. And while that term isn't pejorative inside this building, it is in the real world. The important thing is the quality of the candidate, not whether they sit or stand to take a slash. But aren't women in the coalition being held back by the merit system? Well, if there are women being beaten on merit by Craig Kelly, Richard Colbeck and Stuart Robert, do we really want them being parachuted into Parliament via quotas? And what would it say to the women who did get into Parliament on merit? Uh, hello, I'm a woman too. Well, it demeans their achievement. Yeah, but isn't that like you paying full price for some Peter Alexander pyjamas and then being annoyed at seeing them marked down the next day? I guess you paid more for yours and the woman who gets them at a reduced price, but at the end of the day, uh, when you put on the pyjamas, you've both got a nice new pair of pyjamas. The prestige I attained from being able to afford to pay full price has been trashed because now any old slag can buy them. And it's patronising because what it's saying to my fictional old slag is, hey, we know these are out of your league, dear, so here, we'll make it easier for you. And speaking of women and Peter Alexander pyjamas... <laughs> Well, not coming up because you can't ask that is on in a minute. Premier's loving new national cabinet format, how cockpit got its name, and Boris Johnson flaunts his new hairstyle. And finally, we need to address our vaccine hesitancy. Some Australians are avoiding getting the jab simply because they're scared they'll get a blood clot in their brain and die. In response to calls for a government campaign to encourage greater vaccination take-up, the PM said words to the effect of... There is more communications going into the more elderly population. So communications are going into the elderly, even if the vaccine isn't. What we need is a reassuring government advertising campaign not involving milkshakes, accompanied by catchy lyrics that everyone loves. In the UK, they have... I'm still standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the US... Vaccine, 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 vaccine. Meanwhile, over here... We only will approve vaccines when we have enough evidence that they work and that they're safe. May I suggest this one? It's much loved and also contains handy instructions on how to administer the dose. Into my arms, oh Lord. Goodbye. Giant baby.